Well, good morning, all. So you're there in First Peter, uh, Second Peter, chapter one. Have a look at verse thirteen there. It says, "Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavour that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance." So here, Peter knows that his time is coming short. Like Jesus told him that when you're old, someone else is going to take you where you don't want to go. Speaking of his death, so he knows that his time of his departure is at hand, the time that he's going to be deceased. So he wants to leave certain things in remembrance for the saints to consider and to be a blessing after he's gone. So the title of my sermon is The Last Words of Peter. So you could say that Second Peter are Peter's last words. Okay, and he knows that what he's writing is the word of God. So he's leaving us with the, with the, second, the book of Second Peter, the word of God, and he knows it's not just going to be for his generation because he knows he's writing the scripture. We'll look at that later in the sermon. He knows that even today, like hundreds of years after, people are still going to be reading his last words, the book of Second Peter. And he's left things... Uh, behind for us to always keep in our remembrance. So why has he left these things in remembrance? What's his purpose in leaving these things behind for us to read? Well, Peter knows he is going to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. He knows he's ran the race well. He's fought the good fight. He knows when he enters into glory, it's going to be an abundant entrance. And he wants believers also to, to likewise have that same abundant entrance into the kingdom. Have a look at verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, giving diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So he knows he's going to have that abundant entrance himself. But that's not all, that's not, he's not happy with that. He wants us also, the people who would read his epistle, to also have an abundance, ent abundant entrance in the kingdom of God. And his last words are words which can help us if we take heed to what he, what he writes. We also can have that great entrance into the kingdom of God. So I do have... Four points from the book of Second Peter, from Peter's last words. And if we were to, if we were to take heed to these uh, points, we would likewise have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. So now turn to keep your place there in Second Peter and turn to Luke chapter 9. So what I want to look at now is an example of two saints which have already lived and died, but they had that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. And Peter, I believe Peter is thinking about these saints as he's writing second peter so luke chapter 9 verse 28 it's a story about moses and elijah on, the, on mount Tr transfiguration and it came to pass about eight days after these sayings he took peter and john and james and went up into a mountain to pray and as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering and behold there talked with him two men which were moses and elias who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So here's Peter, James and John, and he gets to see two saints which have already entered into the kingdom, that's being Moses and Elijah, in glory with Jesus. So he's looking at these two guys and he's realising, well, they had an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Like of all the saints in glory, it's Moses and Elijah that get to and meet with Jesus on the earth and, and minister to him and talk with him. So these guys have had an abundant entrance. And Peter, I believe, he's remembering this as he knows his time's coming for him to depart. Likewise, he's thinking about Moses and Elijah. And thinking, well, that, I'm next. It's going to be me. I'm going to be going to heaven soon. But then he wants us also to have the same an abundant entrance into the kingdom. You remember about Peter, like he spent three years with Jesus, like that would have been amazing, just three years with Jesus, listening to Jesus and seeing what things he emphasised, what things he repeated. And I believe Peter, when he's writing Second Peter, like he's probably going to be emphasising the things which Jesus emphasised to him and he's passing them down onto us. So like these apostles like John, James and, and Peter in particular, like spent so much time with Jesus and that must have influenced their life, their preaching and their epistles. So we can get a good picture of what Jesus would have been talking about a lot by their epistles. And Second Peter, look, will be no, no different. So 
And Peter's writing, there's well, four points I want, I want to share with you. And we ought to, you know, take heed to what Peter's got to say. Spending all that time with Jesus, he probably knows what he's talking about, having spent that time listening to Jesus. The first point I have for you today is, is we need to be diligent as believers. We need to be diligent. Like, if we want to finish the, this race well and have that abundant entrance, like, we need to be diligent. So turn to chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. So it's Peter saying to us, we need to be diligent. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So Peter's saying we need to give all diligence to our Christian walk. So what's, what's it mean to be diligent? Well, diligent means to be careful and persistent, uh, to, means careful and persistent work or effort. Like it takes effort. Like di- being diligent, it's, it's hard work. It's being persistent at working hard. And Paul said, um, as, as soldiers of Jesus Christ, endure hardship. Like it's, it's hard work. Being a believer is hard work. And if we want to have that abundant entrance, well, we need to be diligent. So what's it mean to be diligent? Well, let's have, I'll, if you can... Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And just before we look at what diligent actually looks like in practical terms, it says there, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we need to be diligently seeking the Lord if we want to be rewarded of God. If we want to be rewarded in that abundant entrance into heaven, we need to be diligently seeking him in our life on planet Earth. But what does that look like? It's one thing to say, be diligent, but look, well, what does that look like in my life? Like, what's Practically, what is, what is being diligent? Well, let's have a look back at Second Peter chapter 1 and verse... We'll go to verse 5. So there, and besides this, giving all diligence. Now here we go, add to your faith virtue. So we need to add things to our faith if we're going to be diligent. So the first thing that Peter says we need to add to our faith is virtue. So what's virtue? Like virtue is like moral excellence. You start to make some changes to your life. After you're saved, you need to get some virtue in your life. Well, your conscience should be troubled about certain things after you're saved. And when you're having virtue in your life, you're starting to like quit doing certain things. Like, for example, for me, a couple of the big things in my life when I got saved which started to trouble me was smoking pot, <laughs> which, of course, you shouldn't be doing. So you don't need to be a theologian to understand I shouldn't be smoking pot as a believer. And a lot of um, wicked music I was listening to. So these things, like in particular, troubled me. So then I, I, I burnt most of my music collection, chucked out some of the, some of the other stuff, and quit smoking pot. So you could say I added some virtue to my life. And we, we ought to do that once we're saved. That's the first thing that we can add to our faith is virtue. And other people who used to run with you and be in the same crowd as you, they should be able to look at you and go, look, Brother so and so, sister so and so, look, they're not the same anymore, and they may even speak words against you. Like people who knew me, they, they knew that I smoked lots of pot and listened to certain types of music, and they were talking, saying, "Look, Jason burned all his music collection. He doesn't smoke pot anymore," and they were saying these things uh, about me. Who knows what else they were saying? You know, probably you know tearing me down. But this reminds me of um, Second Peter chapter one verse four, where it says, "Whereby are given." Oh, no, sorry, Second Peter. Our uh, first Peter chapter four, verse three, it says, "For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you." So once you're saved, we should be not running with the same crowd. And they should then be speaking evil against you, saying, what's wrong with this person? He's lost his mind. He's got all religious. He's gone crazy about church and Jesus. And that's what, if you add virtue to your life, that's what people are going to be saying. So we need to add virtue to our faith. And then to virtue, what should we add? We should add knowledge. Let me read to you verse 5 again. And besides this giving or diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So how do you add knowledge to your faith? Well, by reading the scriptures. 
by reading the Bible. That's what we should be doing as, as believers, reading the Bible and getting that godly knowledge. We need to understand what does God expect of me as a believer? What things can I do to please God? What doesn't please God? You start to understand doctrine and how we ought to live as believers. And these, this is what we need to do. It takes diligence. It takes hard work. It takes getting up early in the morning, making some time during the day to read your Bible. It takes diligence. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So as newborn babes in Christ, we, we need to be reading the word of God and can, all the way through your life. We need to continue to read the word of God. It never gets old. It never gets boring like as long as you keep reading it it's going to be great and edifying and refreshing and 2 timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be perfect freely furnished unto all good works so we need to add that knowledge from reading the scriptures so if we want to have that abundant entrance at the end of our life into the kingdom of god we need to be adding these things we need to be diligent and add virtue knowledge to our faith and also we need to add temperance we need to add temperance to our faith our temperance is like like self-control like if you start to under, you start to read the Bible, you start to get some knowledge about what pleases God and what doesn't, then you need to start to exercise some self-control to your life and then start to become obedient to that knowledge that you have. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. So that's what we're talking about in this sermon, obtaining that incorruptible crown at the end of your life, that you receive that full reward, that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God, but we need to have temperance. So Peter knows that. So Peter's saying, add temperance to your faith. If you want to be that person, if you want to be like me when I enter heaven, well, you need to have temperance in your faith. And we need to temper our behaviour as believers with our knowledge of the Bible. We need to control ourselves in our, in our habits. We don't want to be overeating. We don't want to be drinking and smoking. We need to have some self-control, even in our, in our temper, like how we behave ourselves. We, we don't want to be quick to anger. We want to be slow to wrath and not quick to anger. And this is all to do with self-control. So Peter's saying, add temperance to your, to your faith. And also, we need to then add patience. And to knowledge, we add the temperance, and to temperance, patience. And we need to be, and then to the next one will be godliness, adding godliness to our, to our patience. But patience is like an inescapable part of the Christian life. We are going to have to learn to be patient. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8. If you can turn to James chapter 5, and patience, you're going to have to deal with patience. We're going to have to learn patience in the Christian life. Because like the Christian life is not a 100-metre dash. It's, it's a marathon over your whole life. Sometimes over 70 years, 60 years, however long you're going to live, it, it's a marathon. It's a marathon race. And Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. James 5 verse 7 says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So we need to be patient. Like all the prophets, Job, been patient in their lives and they received a great reward. And we also are going to have to learn patience. And to patience, we add godliness. We add godliness. And so godliness should be the, the goal of the believer. And again, look, that takes patience. <laughs> it takes patience to learn godliness. It takes a whole lifetime to learn godliness and become godly. And if you think about it, the more of the Bible that we read, the more knowledge we have, 
then we can grow in, in that knowledge and grow in that godliness because we understand but through the scriptures what godliness is and with patience and temperance we can start to become more godly. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 says, But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So we see we, Peter saying, look, to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God, be godly. You need to live a godly life. You need to live a godly life. And to brotherly kindness, uh, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. So then we add kindness as well to our godliness. So what's the point of having all this Bible knowledge and trying to be so godly, you, you, you can't be kind? Like we ought to be kind. We ought to be known by, known by our kindness to one another. And kindness is an attribute of, of God himself. Like God is kind to us. And let me read to you. Titus chapter 3 verse 4 says, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, towards man appeared. So God is kind to us, and we ought to be kind one to another, which is Ephesians 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So I believe kindness is a good gauge where you can measure how well am I, am I doing in the Christian life? How well are you doing? Are you kind? To your brethren in church are you tender-hearted are you forgiving we ought to be you know, peter's saying look you need to do these things if you want to do well in your christian life have that abundant entrance be kind one to another and look it's an attribute of god as well and that leads to the next point we need to add to our faith is and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity charity so what's charity like charity is love in action and look, what a blessing we get to, to do that to our brethren. We need, we need to put our love into action. And look, in practical ways, that can be when, like when someone's moving house, we turn up and help them. You know, if someone has a baby, we do what we can do to support them. And you know, if someone's in need, we can step in and, and help that person. That's, that's all charity. That's, that's that Christian love in action. And 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So it's not all about having all this Bible knowledge. What's the point of having all this Bible knowledge if you're a mean person? Like, they're out there, aren't they? Like, you, we meet people out there that know the Bible apparently so well, but they're mean, they're not kind at all, and we don't want to be like that. We want to have that Christian love balanced out with our Bible knowledge. And 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profit to be nothing. I think we need some charity. Peter knows if we're going to finish this life well, we need to be having some charity in our lives. And look, we all know how we could probably all do better. We know how, how well we're doing or how well we're not doing. So this is what it means to be diligent. All these seven things we need to add to our our, our life. Well, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Like it's, it's, it's the Christian life is hard. So let's just recap the first point. Add to our faith virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, then godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. That's what it means to be a diligent believer. That's a lot of work, isn't it? It's a lot of work. It takes effort to be, um, be, to be diligent. And if we can do these things, Peter says in verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, but if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So Peter's saying, you do these seven things, you're going to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. And that's what we should be aiming for. 
That's what we should be aiming for. Just don't settle just to, to slide by in life and get to heaven. And look, that's fantastic. If you get to heaven, that's fantastic. But we should be aiming to have an abundant entrance into heaven. And Peter, like Peter's last words are so that we can do that. And let's have a look at Acts chapter 7. If you can turn to Acts chapter 7, let's look, look at an example of somebody who did have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So we've already looked at Moses and Elijah. Let's look at Stephen. Acts 7 and verse 55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And then they stoned him and, you know, Steve, you know the story, Stephen died and went to heaven. But look, that was no small blip on the radar of heaven when, when Stephen died and went to heaven. Like Jesus stands up, he's paying attention and he's ready to receive Peter. And look, that's how we should be when we die. Like we shouldn't be just go into heaven under the radar and heaven doesn't even notice because we didn't do any great works. Like when we go to heaven, like heaven should pay attention. Heaven should know. Well, think about when, when Peter died and, and Paul and John and all the great saints. It would have been a big deal when they entered into heaven. So when you enter into heaven, look, let's make sure it's a big deal to heaven. Make sure you do have that abundant entrance into heaven. And that's what Peter wants us to have. That's why we have these last words of Peter in Second Peter. If you if we pay heed to, to these points, then we can have that abundant entrance into heaven. And Jesus will, will pay attention when he arrives. And there'll be some, maybe a celebration when you get to heaven. I'm sure like Jesus is paying attention here to Stephen. And what's Stephen doing? Well, he's, he's being diligent. He's preaching the word of God, standing firm on the scriptures, preaching hard against the false prophets and, and the wicked people. And Jesus is paying attention. And he had an abundant entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And the first point was that we need to be diligent. And the second point that we can take from Second Peter is that we need to hold fast to the word of God. If we want to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of heaven, let's hold fast to the word of God. So turn to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. For this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Peter's saying here, he puts more emphasis, more trust in the word of God than his own experiences. And if we're going to uh, achieve what God wants us to achieve in this life, have that abundant entrance, we need to make sure we stay firm upon the word of God and not drift off into extra biblical teachings and trusting in other visions and experiences. We need to stay firm to the word of God. So Peter is emphasising the scriptures above his own experiences and that's what he wants us to do as well. And many people today, they do the opposite, don't they? Like, they will lean more upon their experiences than the Word of God. And if you've been soul winning, like, you would have come across that when you speak to people and you show them clearly what the Bible says about certain things. And they'll say, look, well, I know what I experienced. I know what you're saying is true, but look, I know what I, I experienced. And my experience trumps the Word of God. And that's what they're saying. And Peter's saying, no, the prophecy of Scripture is a more sure word, even though he had a true experience. His experience was, was real. He's saying, no, we need to stick to the scriptures as our main source of revelation from God. And Peter's saying too, that it says there that they were, let me read it to you again, it says that uh, prophecy came, uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
And second, Peter is an example of someone who was moved by the Holy Ghost and spoke scripture. So Peter knows what he's writing is scripture. Let me just show you that. So turn to chapter 3 of Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 1 says, This second epistle, behold, I now write unto you, in both which I stir you up, stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. So he's he referring to the Old Testament prophets as, as scripture, right? And then he elevates the writings of, of, him, of himself and the apostles to the same level as the Old Testament prophets. So he knows what he's writing is scripture. And he's leaving us the scripture. He's writing us uh, his scripture, Second Peter. And he also says in, in verse 15 there that the writings of the apostle Paul are also scripture. Have a look there, verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So he's saying like what Paul's writing is scripture because then he says, and the other scriptures as well. So he's saying what Paul's writing is scripture. What Peter's writing is scripture and same with Paul and all the apostles of the New Testament, look, they wrote scripture. And what Peter's leaving with us is the scripture. So he's not saying, look, now that I'm, I know I'm going to go to heaven, it's, it's time for my departure. He's not like he's, you're going to take out his special secret teachings of Jesus and then at, at the last minute give us those secret teachings. But they, they don't exist. Like he's just saying the same things over and over again that he's always said and that, that Jesus emphasised in his life. So we don't want to be deceived by false prophets who come and they say, look, I've got the, the seven keys to the spiritual realms of power, and if you buy this book and do my course. So we, want, we don't want to be like that. Like Peter wasn't like that. John wasn't like that. Let me read to you from, um, if you can turn there, 1 John chapter 2. One John chapter two, and the New Life Baptist Church. Like, we don't come up with new doctrines. We're we're just saying the same old things which have always been said. We're not bringing up any new teachings. And one John chapter two verse seven, we have the Apostle John now saying, "Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning." So John, at the end of his life, he's just saying, look, I'm just preaching the same old things over and over again. I've got no new commandments, just the same old commandments, which is the word of God. That's what he's preaching. And that's what we need to be preaching and listening to as believers if we're going to overcome in this life and have that abundant entrance into the kingdom. Now jump down to verse 24. 1 John 2 verse 24. That that therefore... Abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So if we want to continue to be walking with the Lord, we need to just be holding fast to those same old things we heard from the beginning. And this is the promise that he had promised us, even eternal life. And these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. So we're going to have those false prophets which are going to try and come in to seduce us into going from the Word of God, trusting in their visions, trusting in extra biblical revelations, and that's going to ultimately lead us to, to being, a sh being shipwrecked. And the third point in the sermon is beware of false prophets. So Peter spent a whole chapter in Second Peter talking about false prophets. So he, if he, wants, he, he knows that if we're going to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom, we need to be watching out for false prophets and avoiding them. So if you can do the Second Peter and chapter one, chapter two, uh, Second Peter chapter two, verse one. And Peter, uh, yeah, Peter gives us a warning here about watching out for false prophets. So the first point was we need to be diligent. The second point, we need to hold fast to the word of God and don't go aside into um, false doctrine and, and 
uh, extra biblical revelations. And the third point is beware of false prophets. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So Peter's saying, look, there's going to be false prophets among us. They're going, they are going to sneak in, and we need to be aware of them. So this is something that we need to be understanding of. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of, uh, evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. So these false prophets that will creep in, they're going to creep in because they're, they're, they're covetous people and they'll be looking at us and just seeing dollar signs, seeing merchandise, seeing people that, that they can manipulate and use and take from. That's, that's how they think. That's how they operate. And jump down to verse 13. Let's keep reading. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So these false prophets will try and creep in and fellowship with us, commune with us, spend time with us, but inwardly, like these are wicked people looking to deceive us, looking to take from us. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. So they're looking for those unstable Christians, those Christians that aren't diligent. They're looking for those ones. They'll creep in and they'll be looking to see who's the weak believer, who's someone I can come around and entangle and make merchandise of them and take from them. That's what they're looking for. But I thank God, like in this church, like there's not too many unstable souls. Like we're a solid church. And we've had people try and creep in over the years, haven't we? And they just come in, look, there's no unstable souls here, I'm going. There was one guy, he had some like, strange doctrine, you know, strange teachings about the end times, and he came in he, and he was trying to you know, get a platform with our people in our church. And again, like this guy, he, he wasn't really coming with clear scripture, but he would come in with like, his own visions and, and dreams. And one time he's telling us, look, I had this dream, and in this dream this happened and I saw this. Because what he's trying to do is give credibility to himself by adding these, these spiritual dreams. And then, like, it works for a lot of Pentecostals. I think, oh, wow, that's an amazing vision. Like, this guy, is, God's moving in this guy's life. But, like, he's a deceiver. Like, and then he couldn't get no, no platform with us, and he's, like, he's gone. We, we, after that, he never came back because there's no unstable souls. And we don't want to be unstable. Let's keep reading verse 14. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. See, these false prophets, they just loved the wages of unrighteousness. They loved money. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. It says there they are wells without water. So you might see these prophets, they come in, they want to look like a cloud that's carrying lots of water. They want to look like a well that's got lots of water on the outside. Like you can see a well and it can look, look like a good well. You can see a cloud and you can say, look, that's, that's a good looking cloud. But these false prophets, like there's no water in their cloud. There's no water in their, in their well. Once you start talking to them and listening to them, you realise this guy's off the deep end. Like he, on the outside, he's looking like a sheep, but inside, like he's a, he's a ravening wolf. And that's what they're like. Verse 18 For when they speak great, swelling words of vanity, well, that's so true. Like these false prophets, they speak a big, a big talk. They swell their words up and they say all these great things about themselves, all these experiences they've had, and all these things that God's told them, things they've done, swelling words, trying to deceive those unstable souls. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantedness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For over whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. 
So these false prophets, they want to bring you into bondage to themselves. And if that happens, Peter knows, well, you're not going to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God because these false prophets are seeking to derail your faith in God, in the word of God, and become in bondage to them. And they're already in corruption. So if you become in bondage to these people, like you're going to be corrupted and, and in bondage just like they are. So Peter's saying, watch out for these false prophets because they're going to come. If we want to receive that full reward, we need to be aware and not deceived by these people. And what they want to do is they want to take you away from receiving that full reward that God's got for you. If you can turn to 2 John chapter 1, I'll read to you from Matthew 24, verse 3. And Jesus also warned about these false prophets. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And then in verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. The first thing out of Jesus' mouth was, Make sure no one deceives you. But of all the things he could have said, he said, look, make sure no one deceives you because the false prophets are coming and we don't want to be... First of all, we don't want to be naive. We don't want to take it for granted that we're not going to be deceived. Jesus is saying, look, take heed. So we need to be diligent and take heed that we don't get deceived by these false prophets because they will stop you from receiving that full reward if you are deceived by these guys. So 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Like we ought to aim for a full reward and these deceivers, false prophets, they will shipwreck your faith so you don't receive that full reward, so you don't have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. So let's make sure we realise that false prophets are going to creep in. Peter said, be diligent, read the word of God, stick firm to the word of God, don't go aside to fables, uh, visions, revelations, those sort of things, and also beware of false prophets. And the last one is, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, we also we should be looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. This is another theme that's emphasised in Peter's last words. We're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. If you can turn there. But the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So Peter's saying we need to be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. As believers, that should be our, our, our mindset. We should be looking forward to, those, to that time when Jesus returns. That should be something that's very much on our mind, on our heart. And if we do that, then it's going to cause us to live a certain way. We're not going to be living for this world because we know it's going to be burnt up. It's going to be dissolved. Therefore, we're looking forward and living according to God's kingdom, looking forward to those, those things which are coming. And again, that's, just, that's to do with like having knowledge. We need to add knowledge to our virtue, add knowledge to our faith so we can understand these things, so we can understand the end times, then we know we've got to look forward to. And that's going to then cause us to have temperance in our life and live a life that's going to be holy and pleasing to God. Nevertheless, we, so Peter's saying we, like this is what Peter did in his life, according to his promise, look for new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So this is something that Peter personally did himself. He's mindful of there's going to be a new heaven, there's going to be a new earth, and that's what he's thinking about, that's what he's looking forward to. And that's why, that's what's helping him to keep being a diligent believer and keep being faithful to the Lord because he knows there's so much to look forward to. And we need to understand the things that we have to look forward to, and that's going to help us to be motivated and stay on track. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. There's that word again, be diligent. But Peter's talking about being diligent a lot in this epistle. That ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. 
So Peter's saying, look, when, you, when your time comes, be without spot. And one way we can do that is by understanding there's, there's things to look forward to and by looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So right now, we need to be looking forward to these things. See, many Christians, they don't even understand about end times. Like most churches don't care for end times. They'll say, look, the end times, that's a distraction. That's going to stop you from, you know, trying to live your best life now. You don't want to be, you know, worrying about the end times and understanding the end times. Well, that's not our focus. We're just focusing on helping you, you know, buy that second boat and that second house and, and build that business and be a blessing so you can, you know, be, be blessed so you can be a blessing. All that nonsense. But Peter, the apostle Peter, who spent that three years with Jesus, he realises, no, look, if you want to be a, an overcoming Christian, you need to understand end times. But Peter's thinking about the new heavens and the new earth, and I bet Jesus spoke a lot with the apostles about what's to come. Because Peter, he's, he's emphasising the end times. He's emphasising the second coming. Jesus like, spoke a lot about it in Matthew 24, Luke 21, in the book of Mark. He's speaking about the end times, things which are coming, and we need to be looking forward to these things. So that's just a recap on what we've looked at so far. So Peter's writing this epistle, his last words, so we can remember certain things. And these things he wants us to remember are going to help us to have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Because he knows he's going to have that abundant entrance. He's going to be blessed when he enters into heaven, but he wants us also to have the same abundant entrance. So he's saying you need to add to your faith. You need to be diligent and add to your faith. All these things, virtue, knowledge, temperance, self-control, patience, all these things we need to add to our faith. And then he says, look, we need to stand fast on the word of God. Stick to the word of God. Don't add anything new. Don't turn aside to new teachings. Just stick, stick to the fundamentals of the word of God. And then he says, watch out for false prophets because they're going to come in and try and derail your faith and cause you to lose that great reward. And lastly, we need to be looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. That's, that's our blessed hope, is that Jesus is going to return and we're going to be with him and we're going to receive that full reward. Like, like we are going to be rewarded for the work that we do here. And if we understand that, we understand there's going to be a millennium kingdom where we're going to rule and reign with Christ. That's going to motivate us to want to live a godly life, to aim for those things and receive that full reward. So let's listen to the last words of Peter today. 2,000 years or so after he wrote them, and we can be like Peter, like Moses, like Elijah, like Paul, like Stephen, and have that abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. And look, we don't want to, just, like I said, slip under the radar into heaven and just appear and no one noticed because he didn't do anything. Let's be ones that will work hard, be sowing, be diligent, and do great works for the Lord. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we 